We are back, and we are joined by our good friend of the show, Jeet here, national affairs correspondent for The Nation, host of the weekly Nation podcast, The Time of Monsters. Uh, Jeet, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Oh, great to be on. So uh, you watched uh, the Harris interview, I'm assuming. We, we started uh, with that clip of her just basically dismissing Trump, trying to goad her into uh, into talking about race and her gender about how she just turned black it's a chameleon uh, yeah exactly and and uh, I, that, that, that was, was a good moment, moment. That, yeah uh, yeah i actually think that's like the best moment because uh it really captures the tenure of the campaign which is like not to uh get into the mud with trump on this stuff to be dismissive um and also i mean i, I thought the phrase you used was it like the 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 same old right like same the, old playbook uh, yeah same old playbook um uh, which actually like is actually like deeper than um it first seems because i actually think a big problem for trump is he's been around too long uh he's been a national figure now uh uh uh, for more than, almost 10 years um, in national politics. He's, uh, this is a, his third running for the president, right? And, you know, like you have to go back to Willing Jennings Bryan yeah. or, uh, <laughs> to, to, or, you know, uh, Franklin Roosevelt, who actually won the popular vote. Uh, so, so, so people are, people are like, I think, tired of Trump and um, uh, tired of, uh, I mean, I think there are some Democrats who say like, well, you know, um, they point out some outrageous, obscene, vile, misogynist thing that Trump posts on so on true social and says, you know, why isn't the media talking about this? Well, you know, I think I think the people who um, know that Trump is a misogynist already know that, uh, have known that for a long time, <laughs> and you know, you don't need to like underscore this stuff. Um, and and, and exactly, also, it's what they yeah. like. It, it, yeah. In fact, I mean, she's not playing into the, the those hands there because first of all, like. People like his cruelty and his callousness. I mean, yeah, that's yeah, what yeah. his base likes in particular. So when you point it out, you're just reinforcing what they yeah. like. And then to make yeah. it about the same old playbook, you're saying, OK, I'm the change candidate, even though I'm the sitting vice president for a yeah. guy that is deeply unpopular, which is a really difficult tightrope to walk. Yeah, no, no, exactly, exactly, and I, I mean, I think that's um, a big part of the the appeal. I mean, she actually has the um, put herself forward as the uh, I'm something new. Uh, you know, you thought you were going to just get uh, Trump versus Biden, and you know, like now this is a chance to turn the page on that whole chapter of uh, history, which I think most people like, you know, find just an extremely distasteful period. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I thought that was a very sharp response, and it worth kind of pointing out and also i mean the other thing is if you respond in any detail to like trump's idiocy on this you're like engaging the battle on the front that he wants to fight it at you mm -hmm. know he wants to this to be about you know like how black is uh kamala harris uh so, so you know like you don't want to fight him on that ground you want to fight the battle on the grounds that you're you're winning at so i i mean um i, I thought it's a, it's a good indication that i think she's the first democrat to really um uh pull that off to you know try to make you know, this into a post trump um uh, argument right right and and presenting herself as a way to move on from that period yeah. of politics yeah. of of trumpism um to that to that degree and again so much of his appeal to his base is about triggering the libs so what do you do mm. don't get yeah, triggered yeah. It's so good to hear. Yeah, I, I, I have to, exactly. And I have to say, like that base itself, like my my sense is that, like you know, it's not growing. Like there, I mean, in some ways, he's like um, a nostalgia act now. Like they, if you look at his rallies, like he often has the same people. Uh, you know, he partially he foregrounds them, the you know, blacks for Trump people and others. But they, it is like a Grateful Dead concert, like in like uh, 2015 or something, or whenever the last time the Grateful Dead played. Like like it is like a an act that has an appeal to a certain audience, but it's not like, you know, racking up the charts in the way it used to. Exactly. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so let's turn to the, uh, her answer on the economy here. This was her strongest section in addition to what we talked about with the dismissing of Trump. Um, because she's defending Biden's economic record better than Biden ever mm. did. Ever. Yeah. People who cross our border illegally and there should be consequence. And let's be clear, in this race, I'm the only person who has prosecuted transnational criminal organizations who mm. traffic in guns, drugs, and human beings. I'm the only person in this race who actually served 
a border state as attorney general to enforce our laws. And I would enforce our laws as president going forward. Hold I recognize that. Uh, is that the right a time code issue? We just have a bit of an oh, issue. Yeah. Sorry, guys. Oh, We're it's no, the no, no. um it's the other it's part one, Matt. Oh, Sorry. The s CNN cut this up on YouTube in uh, three different sections. So okay, okay, okay. apologies yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I figured that wasn't the one, the clip that you wanted to have. But we can recur to that that clip in a. Uh, uh, we uh, can later. get to that later. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So this was the part where uh, she's asked about the economy. One of your campaign themes is we're not going back. But I wonder what you say to voters who do want to go back when it comes to the economy specifically, <laughs> because their groceries were less expensive, housing was more affordable when Donald Trump was president. Well, let's start with the fact that when Joe Biden and I came in office, it, during the height of a pandemic, we saw over 10 million jobs were lost. Uh, people, I, I mean, literally, we were all tracking the numbers hundreds of people a day were dying because of COVID. Um, the economy had crashed. Uh, in large part, all of that because of mismanagement by Donald Trump of that crisis. When we came in, our highest priority was to do what we could to rescue America. And today, we know that we have inflation at under 3%. A lot of our policies have led to the reality that America recovered faster than any wealthy nation around the world. But you are right. Prices, in particular for groceries, are still too high. The American people know it, I know it, which is why my agenda includes what we need to do to bring down the price of groceries. For example, dealing with an issue like price gouging, what we need to do to extend the child tax credit to help young families be able to take care of their children in their most formative years, what we need to do to bring down the cost of housing. My proposal includes what would be a tax credit of $25,000 for first-time home buyers, so they can just have enough to put a down payment on a home, which is part of the American dream and their aspiration, but do it in a way that allows them, them to actually get on the path to achieving that goal and that dream. So you have been vice president for three and a half years. Yeah. The steps that you're talking about now, why haven't you done them already? Well, first of all, we had to recover as an economy, and we have done that. I'm very proud of the work that we have done that has brought inflation down to less than 3%. The work that we have done to cap the cost of insulin at $35 a month for seniors. Donald Trump said he was going to do a number of things, including allowing Medicare to negotiate drug prices. Never happened. We did it. So now, and I, as I travel in the state of Georgia and around our country, the number of seniors that have benefited. I've met, I was in Nevada recently, a, a, a grandmother who showed me her receipts. And before we capped the cost of insulin for seniors at $35 a month, she was paying hundreds of dollars, up to thousands of dollars a month for her insulin. She's not doing that so anymore. You maintain Bidenomics is a success. Oh my I maintain God. that when we do the work of bringing down prescription medication for the American people, including capping the cost of the annual cost of prescription medication for seniors at $2,000, when we do what we did in the first year of being in office to extend the child tax credit so that we cut child poverty in America by over 50 percent, when we do what we have done to invest in the American people and bringing manufacturing back to the United States so that we created over 800,000 new manufacturing jobs, bringing business back to America. What we have done to improve the supply chain so we're not relying on foreign governments to supply American families with their basic needs, I'll say that that's good work. There's more to do, but that's good work. I want to get some clarity. Okay, so wanted that full explanation there. Um, she did a good job uh, in responding to some of those questions. Now, the housing piece, I wish, wish we weren't uh, making home ownership so central to the economy. Um, yeah. But, like, I have to be, and, and I wish she was emphasizing more, like, the building of housing and bringing down rental prices by attacking corporate landlords. Th these are things she's proposed, but this is about the general election pivot where they feel like mm -hmm. they are going for the middle class family, right? The yeah, yeah. Dr driving them those numbers go ahead yeah uh, on rent on the um housing i mean she's not even going as far as biden himself did where you know like in the, that last desperate bid to save his presidency he was like coming out in favor of rent control uh yeah. uh so yeah i mean it, it is a more 
kind of uh, mainstream appeal than is possible. I mean, like Biden himself has shown, you you can call for national rent control and be a Democrat. But ha- having said that, no, I do think it's a good message uh, on the economy. It's partially just because it's sort of coherently delivered, uh, you know, like with Biden making the same points, uh, you know, like it did not just uh, stick in the public. There's a few issues where Biden had actually retreated from. Um, there's a period uh, about a year ago where Biden started to talk about price gouging, uh, partially because he's prodded to by uh, Elizabeth Warren and Bernie Sanders. Um, and that was polling very well. But then they retreated from that uh, because they got complaints from the um, uh, the donor class. Yeah. Uh, so, so it's actually um, uh, good to see uh, her. That I think that's actually more broadly true of her messaging that it is like um, um, uh, much less um, uh, uh, conflict averse than Biden. By Biden was a very conflict averse candidate. He wanted to like you know not offend anyone as much as possible. Um, and so here, I think we're seeing a couple of cases where she's actually willing to take people on. Oh, my God. Yes, you're totally right about that. And uh, Axios reported the other day that mm-hmm. she brought back this like DNC lawyer who had been central oh, yeah. uh, to Elias. Elias to combating Republicans on election law. Biden quietly had uh, parted ways with him last year because he was being too aggressive in combating Republicans. And they thought that that would scare away moderates to some degree. I mean, the, the level, uh, the, the, that's, that's the point is that I'm energized by the willingness to engage in m- making your ideas to the American public mm. as opposed to doing the nonsense triangulation that the, campa- that the Biden campaign ideologically uh, and his team was uh, obsessed with. And like, even with abortion, the reports were that his top advisor, Mike Donilon, was telling him that the reason the Democrats did well in 2022 in the midterms uh, and that there was not a red wave was because of his moderate position on abortion, because of his personal Catholicism and things like that. And I mean, that, that, <laughs> no, no, the, the Democrats did well on that issue, on that yeah. issue, in spite of you, yeah. dude, not because of yeah. anything you did. Yeah, I don't know. I, I will remind uh, uh, viewers and listeners, uh, I think they're aware of this, but it's worth underscoring. Joe Biden was not on the ballot in uh, 2022 and hasn't been on the ballot in all these special elections uh, where the Democrats are overperforming. Um, and it, that was actually a real grassroots effort to like sort of foreground abortion, uh, sometimes in the defiance of party leadership um, that has actually like, you know, made this the winning issue uh, that it's turned out to be. So um, absolutely. I mean, yeah, um, uh, uh, you know, I, I think well, when they do a mini series about all this, the greatest moment will be uh, when Nancy Pelosi is talking to Biden and says, you know, uh, put Donilon on the phone. Yeah. Uh, meaning right. that, you know, like I want to actually like uh, take issue with uh, the numbers that Donilon's giving you uh, because they're uh, fraudulent. Um, and, and I think that uh, on the abortion front and the sort of shift in messaging, I think the, um, you know, the shift in messaging from the Biden democracy message to the uh, Harris freedom message. I don't think people recognize enough that a lot of that is driven by um, uh, reproductive freedom. Uh, mm-hmm. th- that's a way of making reproductive freedom uh, more valuable. And they also a way of making the whole issue of democracy less abstract. It's not like when people think of democracy, think, think of, you know, well, I vote every two years or I vote more likely every four years. Um, uh, and you, there's these guys in Washington that, you know, uh, uh, say a lot of things that I don't really understand. But freedom is actually like, you know, something very central to the lived experience of Americans in politics. It's, uh, you know, the, the, the freedom to be able to, yes. you know, get an abortion when you need it. Uh, uh, or, you know, more broadly, you know, the freedom not to have to pay like uh, uh, thousands of dollars for medicine that you actually need to stay alive. Uh, so so, so um, there's been a, a more general shift from less sort of very abstract arguments to very concrete arguments. From like solemn patriotic duty to uh, this is yeah. what we're going to do for you. Uh, like yeah. that's, I mean, the, 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 the joy piece, right? It's, it's, it, we, there's, you can be cynical about it, of course. And, you know, we're, we're about to play her pretty awful answer on uh, Israel policy, but um, that it's, it's about, almost positive rights versus this defensive posture that was embodied both in the messaging from the Biden campaign and in uh, the the strategy too. But I will also say, 
media critique, it's sometimes uh, tired, but those questions from Dana Bash, like, I mean, yeah, it's just, her. it's insane. It's insane. So you embrace Bidenomics. Like, it, th there's no, they keep saying how she's not detailed enough on her, on her economic policies, right? Mm -hmm. And, and, and the, the, the Times mm -hmm. and the Washington Post, they're putting out these pieces about that. But she is being detailed. She was explicit in that, in that, it, it, especially when you compare it to Donald Trump, who's saying nothing. They just don't like the answer about price gouging. So they're trying to hit her and say that she's not detailed enough when that's not even the correct critique about this, if you mm -hmm. want to make a critique. Yeah, no, no, no. Although, I mean, not to defend uh, uh, Dana uh, uh, Bash, Bash, but I do the Bash, yeah. But I do think that the um, uh, uh, the point about Bidenomics, the one reason why it kind of works as a hit was that there was a point. Um, people forget all this, but like about a year or two ago, the Biden White House, their whole thinking was at that point, well, we just have to embrace Bidenomics and say Bidenomics is working and the economy is great and things are wonderful. Um, uh, and and so at that, I mean, I think that lingering memory uh, of that moment, which was like a terrible argument, and it's very different from the argument that uh, Harris is making, where her, her her whole argument is like, you know, like we've done good things, but there's a lot more work to do. And here's what I'm going to do for you, which is a future oriented message. Um, and which is a, a message of like, you know, like actually promising things to for people rather than like, you know, you should be grateful. I am the great defender of democracy and uh, I've already given you a wonderful economy. Right. Um, and now let's turn to, to Israel. Um, so uh she's asked um by dana bash here about uh what her position is on uh israel and she essentially repeats exactly what she said at the convention and exactly the biden administration line in chief uh, president biden has tried unsuccessfully uh to end the war between israel and hamas in gaza nope He's been doing it for months and months along with you would you do anything differently? For example, would you withhold some U.S. weapons shipments to Israel? That's what a lot of people on the progressive left want you to do. Uh, let me be very clear. I'm unequivocal and, and unwavering in my commitment to Israel's defense and its ability to defend itself. And that's not going to change. But let's take a step back. October 7, 1,200 people were massacred many young people who were simply attending a music festival. Women were horribly raped. As I said then, I say today, Israel had a right, has a right to defend itself, we would. And how it does so matters. Far too many innocent Palestinians have been killed. And we have got to get a deal done. We, we were in Doha. Mm -hmm. We have to get a deal done. This war must end. In the meantime, and we must get a deal that is about getting the hostages out. I've met with the families of the American hostages. Let's get the hostages out. Let's get the ceasefire done. But no change in policy in terms of arms and, and so forth. No, I, we have to get a deal done. Dan, Dana, we have to get a deal done. When you look at the significance of this, to no, the families, uh, to the people who are living in that region. Um, it, a deal is not only the right thing to do to end this war, but will unlock so much of what must happen next. I remain committed since I've been on October 8 to what we must do to work toward a two-state solution, where Israel is secure and in equal measure, the, Pal the Palestinians have security and self-determination and, and dignity. Um, okay I so yeah <laughs> um i think people are running with the no a little bit it's more to me a uh, dismissal than it is an outright declaration of policy she's trying to not declare anything right she's trying just to like, just yeah, yeah, yeah. get through it get to the other side it wouldn't be smart for her to just unilaterally declare policy even if she agrees with biden let's just stipulate that right it wouldn't be smart for her to be like yeah i'm concretely doing exactly what he's doing because she's not in the position to un to to do that yet right um but still 
this is so insufficient and I don't think she I don't think that that she can get through this election with that while uh, by just trotting that line out like that. It's just not sustainable. Yeah, no, and I, and I agree with you on that. I mean, like, um, in some ways, she's uh, had the same uh, conundrum as Herbert Humphrey running in 68, where he's like a, a vice president, the, the president's not running, uh, but the president is still the president and is still carrying out an unpopular policy. Uh, in Lyndon Johnson's case, a very unpopular policy of the Vietnam War. And it's very hard for a vice president to be critical. Uh, but actually, like in 68, um, uh, towards the end of the election, Humphrey starts to distinguish himself more from uh, Lyndon Johnson. And that was a point where he started to improve in the polls. Uh, ultimately, not enough to win. But I mean, like, it is a sort of significant thing that, like, at a certain point, people are interested in uh, like a new messaging and like it doesn't have to be like super specific like um uh you know like one could say like as eisenhower did in like 52 you know like i will go to korea so uh, you know like i think if she said you know like um you know like I, we have to get a deal um if it's not done now you know like i, I i'm gonna go um uh, uh to do the negotiations myself in person. They, just something to indicate that there's going to be some different, something different. I mean, I, I think politically that would be the much smarter move uh, than, than what they're doing now. Uh, and, and, the and, and Elizabeth Warren gave her this suggestion. She went on television and she said, you just have to say, I'm going to follow the law. Uh, hmm. the, the, the thing that Harris doesn't want to do is also to implicate Joe Biden in not following oh. the Leahy law, which he's not. Being a war criminal. But... But yeah. and, right. But but that's you know, that's what she should do. Right. But they're they, yeah. they need to throw the old man overboard at some point. And they have to. And I mean, it's just such a delicate situation because I think it was very hard to, uh, you know, get Biden to not do it. And one sees like there's a lot of evidence uh, that Biden is trying to entrench his own policy. Like, I think we have to I think people underestimate the degree which Biden or at least Biden's handlers, which might be more plausible, the, the sort of national security team he has around, they are like ideological true believers in this approach. They think that this is the way to go. Um, and uh, there's been some good reporting in the Huffington Post um, about some recent appointments that Biden has made to like national security Post, which is like, you know, people who think along the same lines as like Jake Sullivan and Tony Blinken. And I think the idea is to, to sandbag Harris uh, to make sure that, you know, like uh, it'd be very hard for her to maneuver and to change policy. Uh, we, I think we have to understand that dynamic as well. Like, I don't think, I mean, we think like, you know, Biden's out of the way. He's, he's no longer there, but he's actually president. And yep. more importantly, his, his uh, uh, foreign policy team is still the team. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, another possible uh, way is some of her surrogates, some of the people who are her foreign policy um, advisors uh, could be, you know, putting out statements or putting out feelers. Uh, I, I, it's, it's a very hard position to be in, uh, but it's frankly a crappy thing. I mean, like it's part of you know <laughs> Joe Biden's crappiness, but also the, the broader crappiness of the the political party that they are like unwilling um, uh, to do this. And I, I emphasize like this is a very close election. Like uh, they were going to lose under Biden. Uh, now they have a chance to win under Harris, but it's by no means a sure thing. We shouldn't be taken away by, you know, uh, the politics of joy and all this, like, feel good that we have. Like, if you actually look at the polls, like, you know, um, she's, like, has a small lead in the swing states now, but it's a small lead. Um, Trump often polls above the um, his polling numbers. Uh, it would only take a very small polling error for Trump to win. Uh, and in that situation, like to alienate like a significant chunk of your own voters on this issue, uh, seems like like um, I don't know. I, it's hard she, to describe she, the, the sort of the, madness. The the uh, po the continued efforts to not be specific about any change uh, yeah. is is it's not tenable. And you know, uh, if there are a lot of people in the IM saying, no, this is her position. This is exactly what her position is. I I've We've laid out this on the show, my, my view on this, and I can repeat it right now. People can disagree with me if they'd like. But uh, no Democrat is going to be sufficient on this topic. Um, you, we can hope for somebody who can be pushed. My view is that she's more pushable than Biden and that the people she surrounds herself with, like Phil Gordon, her national security advisor has 
a, has better policy as it relates to the Middle East that's more focused on de-escalation and less ideological Zionism. Uh, Jeet, I'm wondering if that's your view as well on this. Yeah, no, no absolutely. I mean, um, I, I think the key here is that uh, Biden's team is very focused on Iran and the idea that you have to absolutely build this alliance system, the Abraham Accords, uh, between Saudi Arabia and uh, Israel. And I'm like, uh, there's reporting that Biden still thinks that. He thinks that he can still do this. That was a Trump months. policy that Biden's Trump continuing. Policy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it's it's a, a bipartisan policy. And as long as that's the policy, then the, the, there's every incentive to give Israel a kind of free reign. Uh, but I mean, I think that, like, for me, the hope in terms of, like, sort of real politique, uh, you know, the people who man American foreign policy are never going to think the way you and I do. But, I mean, there is a kind of real politique case for disengagement, for de-escalation. Um, and there's, there's two strands of this. One is that the Iranian government itself has given a lot of indication that they're open to this. Uh, one is that they've actually shown a huge amount of restraint in responding to um, Israeli provocation and Israeli attempts to escalate this war. And the second is uh, Iranian voters themselves, like in a, a, a surprise that took everyone, uh, no one was expecting, uh, you know, like elected uh, someone who's like um, uh, supports uh uh, negotiating with the United States and starting up again um, the uh, a nuclear deal. Uh, given that reality, and given the fact that like uh, Harris has people around her who um, are also open to uh, negotiations, like like Phil Gordon, um, yep. you know, there's a real possibility that the fundamental structure could change, and that would give her a huge like once you like. Um, stop making it around the boogeyman and think of this as a regional player you have to make a deal with. Uh, that gives you a huge amount more room to actually hold Israel and I have to say Saudi Arabia accountable. Uh, and uh, apparently Iran, you know, is looking to, I mean, they're displaying this with their restraint with Israel. They yeah, want yeah. to re re-engage with the West. They want to yeah. uh, have a better relationship uh, with the United States and the players in the West as well um, for their own yeah. uh, aims, right? Yeah, and... no, I think mean, their economy has been suffering. And I have to say, this is not just yeah. the Iranian leadership. I mean, who knows what they think, but the Iranian people themselves in the most recent election have made it very clear um, that uh, they themselves do not favor escalation and, uh, you know, like are open to uh, restarting talks with the United States. And so there's actually a great opportunity. And I would actually say, like, if Harris were not bound by Biden, if he were not this anchor that's dragging her down, yep. like, the, the real start case she could make, um, and I think it would be a very successful case, is that if you get Trump, uh, you know, he's the guy that went around assassinating Iranian generals uh, and, uh, you know, pulled out of the Iran nuclear talk uh, and is all in favor of these policies that will, like, escalate a larger war in the Middle East. And, like, I'm open to, like, talking. Like, that would actually be a pretty compelling difference between the arguments and would win over a lot of people that are skeptical of her. Like, would basically say it would be a choice between, you know, someone who will, like, you know, uh, repeat all the mistakes the uh, the United States has made in the Middle East in the past, or someone who wants, like Barack Obama, to like pursue a new path. Like I think that she could actually make that case politically um, yes. if she were not like if Joe Biden did not actually have a veto power over what she can say uh, on foreign policy. Basically, um, yeah. I mean, uh, like I think just case in point, somebody like Obama would have been better in this situation, uh, and, yeah, and, and, yeah. and and would have not been so okay with getting publicly humiliated by Benjamin Netanyahu on the national stage, all yeah. like, or international stage every single day. Yeah, I have to say, I mean, like, people haven't fully processed how bad Biden is. I yep. actually think that a fair number of Republican presidents, uh, like Reagan and Bush Sr. George H.W. Bush would have been better. Yeah, would not have allowed this war to have gone on yes. this long. Would, would have actually like put the priorities of the United States above uh, this, but um, uh, it has to be said. I mean, like Biden, it's partially the ideological Zionism, but it's also partially this this hold of this idea of an Abraham Accords um, has on him. Uh, I mean, for Biden, foreign policy is basically about building alliance systems. Um, it's like collecting cards for him for like uh, for like young kids, right? Like you know, like I built up NATO. I have war members in NATO. Uh, 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 there's this like alliance system in the Pacific. Um, I, I can never pronounce it. 
uh, ACAS, ASAS, whatever the hell, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States. And he, he, he keeps boasting about Arcus, that. ACAS, yeah. ACAS, ACAS, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm the guy that built up Arcus, like, like, like as if one voter <laughs> in a million knows what the hell Arcus is. Uh, and, and Biden thinks the same way about the Middle East. Like, like I'll be the guy that gets the Abraham Accords done. You know, I mean, but like, is foreign policy just about building these like alliance systems that allow you to sell more weapon systems? Uh, right. Or is it also about negotiating with other countries? With uh, diplomacy. You know, with and, diplomacy, and, yeah. And, you know, there's, there's no... I'm sorry. There's no question that a guy like that Phil Gordon, with his record, it's di it's di it's distinct from that. Uh, that's yeah, it's yeah. more about de-escalation versus that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, yeah, that's no, a, no, no. we're getting a no. lot of angry IMs, uh, including uh, <laughs> I'm called a ditzy moron um, here. Thank you for your membership. Um, <laughs> I, I I mean, look, uh, that that's just that's our, that's my it's just my honest view of the situation, and and Jeet, yeah. I think you're on point about it. Yeah, um, yeah, and I, I mean, I, I would say like there are limits to how far his will go. Like, I'm not like super uh, confident that the United States will ever like you know robustly yeah. support Palestinian uh, human rights. And in fact, I think that the best hope for the Palestinians is a kind of American uh, withdrawal from the Middle East and to bring in other uh, uh, parties, other nations uh, th that can negotiate it. Um, I mean, one of the striking things of the Biden era is that Saudi, uh, China has done more for diplomacy in the Middle East than the United States has. China was the one that negotiated um, uh, a de-escalation between Saudi Arabia and Iran. China was the one that negotiated the end of the uh, uh, conflict between Saudi Arabia and Yemen. Uh, so I, th I, I think there's a way which, like, if the United States is like committed to like endless hostility, uh, that's just going to create a, like a path for other powers to move in and, and do actually the work that people want to see done, which is uh, right. negotiation. If if your if your position is just in the interest of furthering American power, it, like from a real politic perspective, as you say, uh, G, you can make that case. Um, yeah. Let Let's turn to the Republicans here, uh, because Trump got himself into a little bit of a pickle with the uh, anti-abortion yeah. activists on his uh, on his side uh, the other day. He was asked here by NBC's Dasha Burns about Florida's six week abortion ban. And it seems like, honestly, he gets confused here. He's he thinks they're at, he's being asked about his national his position nationally uh, for his platform. But it, it it there was backlash because it look it sounded like he's saying that he would vote in favor of the abortion protection measure in Florida where he's supposedly voting. So uh, here here's what his answer was. <laughs> You overturn well, everyone does. You I mean, overturn I think everyone Roe, does, yeah. and you want abortion to be a states' rights issue in Florida, the state that you are a resident of. There's an uh, abortion-related amendment on yeah. the ballot to overturn the six-week ban in mm -hmm. Florida. How are you going to vote on that? Well, I think the six week is too short. Uh, it has to be more time, and so that's. And I've told them that I want more weeks. So you'll vote in favor of the amendment? I'm, I'm voting that I am going to be voting that we need more than six weeks. Look, just so you understand, <laughs> everybody wanted Roe v. Wade terminated for years, 52 years. I got it done. They wanted it to go back to the states. Exceptions are very important for me, for Ronald Reagan, for others that have <laughs> navigated this very, very interesting and difficult path. Oh, very, very. <laughs> <laughs> interesting, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, it's like a great use of the word interesting because it's actually a subject he's not interested in at all. Oh, uh, yeah, right. Kind of like a headache for him. But uh, yeah, no, no, I mean, clearly he's like out of his depth. He, he will say whatever he um, uh, he thinks will get him votes. Um, and and that that is actually like, you know, you are seeing a lot of the uh, anti-choice people being very angry about him on that. And I don't think one can... Um, should underestimate that. I mean, I, I think people sometimes think of these evangelical voters as just these kind of like mindless drones that will always vote for the GOP. But mm -hmm. I, I think there have been points in history um, where they have actually punished the party for uh, not going uh, far enough. And that's actually one reason why they're actually very disciplined voters um, and they have their eyes on the prize. That, that's one reason why it's such a hard issue for the Republicans. And these are actually voters who are willing to stay home 
um, and crash everything um, in order to keep control of the party. I 100% um, agree, Jeet. Um, I know a lot of, of voters who are Republican voters who voted for Trump in 2016, not because they like Trump, they were disgusted by him, uh, but that Supreme Court and abortion <laughs> issue right. drove them out. Yeah. And I think he lost in part by 2020 because he already had the Supreme Court stacked. That urgency was gone. No, that is exactly right. Yeah, I mean, there's like so many ways in which he's uh, unappealing. And also, I mean, I, I thought the uh, it really to this is his sort of thing on the um, IVF, where like you know he's suddenly saying like uh, I want to fund IVF, which is like great. Yeah, let's let's fund all like oh, IVF for want. all. It's yeah, just yeah, IVF, yeah, even yeah, if you yeah. don't want, even if you don't want it, you can get it. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I honestly think like if the. Democrats were a little bit more nimble. They would say, like, wow, that's a great idea. Let's drop the bill. And, you know, like, uh, can, can you, like, make the Republican senators in the House, like, vote on this? Like, um, uh, 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 yeah, almost a great crunch and hoist for uh, Medicare for all. But, 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 I mean, it just shows that he, like, looks at the polls. You know, IVF is hugely popular. Um, it's only, like, the really fanatical, hardcore, anti-choice people that are against it. Um, but... The, you know, like he needs those voters. <laughs> he just like uh, yeah, he needs to he, activate he, them, right? Yeah, I mean, he, yeah, yeah. he, he needs to, like yeah, yeah. like Harris needs the base, right? And why this yeah. this continued dance on Gaza policy is not tenable. Tr Trump needs the base more than she does, honestly, at this point, given uh, his his relative yeah. position in the polls. So, like JD Vance went on TV this morning. He responded to this, right? Because Trump's confused. He thinks that she's asked. Yeah. He doesn't even know what's on. He doesn't even seem to know that there's abortion on the ballot in Florida, which is part yeah. of why, like, Harris had been pouring campaign resources into Florida. It's a long shot. But yeah. that issue is driving people out, right? It's key. Yeah. It's on the ballot in Nevada. It's on the ballot in Arizona. This is really important for the election uh, and and to tr drive out voters who are more likely to vote for Democrats. So he's he, he got confused. J.D. Vance goes on TV this morning on CNN with John Berman, is asked about these comments, and this is what he said. I am going to be voting that we need more than six weeks. <laughs> so the campaign then put out a statement that said Trump has not yet said how he will vote <laughs> on the ballot initiative in Florida. With me now is former President Trump's running mate, Republican <laughs> Vice Presidential nominee, Senator J.D. Vance. Senator, great to have you with us. You can help us clear this up. How can you vote for more than six weeks without voting for the amendment? Well, I think all the president is saying, uh, and of course he's going to make his own announcement on how he's going to vote on the Florida bill, uh, is that he thinks that there should be more than six weeks. And he's been very consistent in that. He says he doesn't like just six weeks. He obviously doesn't like late-term abortion. I think like a lot of Americans, the president is sort of somewhere uh, else on this issue. And he's also said that he wants abortion policy to be made by the states themselves individually and not by the national government. I think that's the most important thing here is that he's, of course, opining on this as a Florida resident. But when it comes to national policy, John, President Trump has been extremely consistent that he wants abortion policy policy to be made by the states. Florida, California, Ohio, they're going to have different approaches. That's okay. What he wants is to focus on eliminating inflation, bringing down the cost of groceries and housing, and closing down that southern border that Kamala Harris opened up. That's where he's focused, and that's where we'll continue to focus for the remainder of the campaign. He said he was going to vote for more than six weeks. So what's your understanding of how he will do that? <laughs> well, I think what he's saying is that he doesn't like doing it at just six weeks. Obviously, he's going to make his own judgment on how he ultimately votes on the amendment. I think he's probably making an argument about how he feels about the issue. Probably. He's not making some proclamation about how he's going to vote on the amendment. And, of course, they clarified afterwards that he wasn't making an explicit determination of how he's going to vote or announcing anything. Uh, look, the president, I'm sure, will tell the American people how he's going to vote on it eventually. But he wasn't yeah. making an announcement last night. So it was a grammar thing. Sorry, could you repeat that, John? <laughs> it, it was a grammar thing. It was a speech thing. It was it was somehow some confusion in the words that he chose. Senator Vance, can you hear me? <laughs> Senator Vance, I may be super staticky. You may not be hearing the the loud baritone of my voice here. Senator, can you All hear right, me, dude? Uh, throwing right, in Senator a little Vance. compliment for himself at the bit, end. Sorry, could you just, could you? Yeah, okay, that just goes on. 
so he's pretending, right? He's pretending. That didn't cut out. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I mean, that's, a, that's a classic uh, trick. Well, which actually, I, I remember Trump doing in 2016 uh, when he's asked about like David Duke. Um, uh, by Wolf Wall Street, he was asked about, like, you know, like, well, David Duke has endorsed you, and Trump was like, well, I'm I, going through a tunnel. I, I, I might lose yeah. you. I'm in the yeah, elevator. Yeah, yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, um, yeah, no, that whole uh, interview with uh, uh, Vance, uh, I, I would really uh, encourage people to uh, to watch it. Um, uh, it uh, uh, will show you why I think Vance is the worst vice presidential pick um, in American history uh, since Aaron Burr, who to be fair, shot someone. Uh, the, uh, the, uh, um, we don't know uh, about J.D. Vance's background. We just don't know. I mean, why did the guy change his name three times? This is good point. Could he be running from the law? We just don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean again, it, it, it does show you, you know, the totally untenable uh, thing. And they do clean up for Trump, who doesn't know what's going on. And frankly, like, you know, um, uh, I mean, I think this is a fair point that Democrats are making, which is that, like, you listen to, like, Trump, and he's, like, out of it. He's not, you know, I think people really underestimate Trump in 2015, 2016, where, you know, we can, we can see all the, the like, uh, loathsome things we want about him, which are true. Uh, but, you know, he had a genuine charisma and was, like, actually, like, actively engaged. Like, Trump is right. a little bit out of it. Like, I, I, I don't think he's quite the... The figure that uh, he was, uh, and so Vance. So in that situation, you want a vice presidential running mate who can do cleanup, uh, and uh, and <laughs> Vance is not the man. He, he does not have that uh, uh, nimbleness. Uh, this is a man who does not know how to order a donut. So, yeah, uh, right. And 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 it's also just like Trump. Think for one second, dude. Why would you be voting on anything? You're not running for Congress. You are running yeah. for president. You are running to sign bills yeah. into law. So, yeah, like, yeah. he doesn't know what he's saying. He thinks it's about his national position, and he gets himself into a pickle here. Because also, when you when you get into... This is where the Republicans are in a bind. When you get into, like, the week by week and the exceptions, right? It's so... You're, you're parsing this stuff, and... The Democrats are making it about a general right, a right of freedom to do what you want. And the Republicans are having these conversations about when they can cut off the procedure, when the point is that over 90 percent of abortions uh, happen in the first trimester. There's like nine percent that happen in the following weeks. Right. But the the one percent, that sliver is when the life of the mother is in danger and the fetus uh, is non-viable, right? Mm -hmm. Or in some of those instances. So when you place restrictions, it's just, it's not actionable. And so people are beginning to understand that because they see these ads and they see a woman bleeding out or a girl who's been sexually assaulted who has to give uh, birth to that baby. It, they're winning on, they're losing on the optics and they're losing on the emotion of the issue. Yeah, no, no. I mean, I mean, the Democrats have like a very clear cut, uh, you know, like stance that they could take, which is like we'll codify Roe. I mean, I actually think they should codify Roe a uh, Roe Plus. Like, like, there's ways in which you can have like a yeah. stronger um, uh, uh, reproductive uh, message than than Roe had. Um, uh, but uh, the on the Republican side, I mean, what, what we hear from Vance is, well, leave it to the states, you know, like um, uh, Texas will like, you know, like be executing mothers. And in New York, it's like, you know, every girl gets an abortion uh, like uh, for her uh, uh, once they turn 13, like, you know, <laughs> like, right. we'll mandate it. uh, which is, it's not like a very coherent position, um, especially since like, uh, you know, since 1865, at least the issue of like this is actually like one country has been settled. Um, and then once you say it's states' rights, you get into all this stuff of, you know, well, what if someone, you know, like uh, right. crosses from uh, uh, Texas to a neighboring state? Um, I, mean, I mean, like, like you know, people... It plays into the bit... Democrats' hands when you, yeah, get, yeah. When, you get, when you get into those kind of uh, details. Uh, it's yeah, almost you, like... What, it means. It, what that means, the states' rights thing means is that the most reactionary state uh, in America... Uh, the Democrats can make an issue of that. They can say, like, we want a national law, and they're having their states' rights exemption uh, means like uh, Oklahoma uh, is like you know like executing uh, abortion doctors. I mean, I mean, like, like I think like that's not a very good place for Republicans to be. 
Totally agree. Uh, Jeet here. Uh, you can uh, find him over at The Nation, uh, host of the weekly Nation podcast, The Time of Monsters. Thanks so much for coming on today. Wrapping up the week. Always, always, always a pleasure. And uh, especially since our, our bearded friend has uh, uh, thankfully been away, I, I, I we missed the opportunity to do a little bit of uh, uh, gossip about him. But Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, you, you went too far by calling him our friend. I mean, let's go. <laughs> yeah. No. Okay. Uh, Appreciate it, G. Thank you. Hey, folks, don't forget to hit the subscribe button and check out our daily show. We do it every day at 12 p.m. Eastern for about two and a half hours. We even take phone calls. You should check that out.